All right. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming back, and and I hope more people join us after well um, in in a few minutes. So we have a very interesting session coming up. It's on segment routing, one of my favorite technologies ever. Uh, and we've, we've got three uh, action-packed sessions, uh, three speakers giving us uh, three different, uh, I guess, perspectives on segment routing and different elements of the technology. So our first speaker <coughs> is Tepei Kamata-san from Cisco Systems. And his topic is segment routing deployments and demonstrations at Interop Tokyo Shownet. Thank you very much, Kamata-san. Thank you for the introduction. Hello, uh, my name is Tepei Kamata. Uh, I'm working as an architect on, uh, in the Cisco Japan and working as also Shonet NOC team. Uh, today, uh, I'm representative of the <coughs> Shonet NOC team and introduce the segment routing deployment and demonstrations at Interrupt Tokyo Shonet. Okay, uh, let me start with the uh, introduction of Interrupt Tokyo. Interrupt Tokyo is the largest uh, exhibition of internet technologies in Japan. Over 200 booths and about 120K visitors for three days. Uh, these visitors, all of the, these visitors is a network uh, related visitors. So, Super, uh, extremely uh, popular event in Japan. About 270 sessions in the ex exhibition and interrupt conference. As you can see in these pictures, all of the session is occupied and uh, all of the booth is crowded in the visitors. So really uh, interesting event in Japan. And this is a show net. Uh, Shonet has its own S number, S290. Uh, we constructed the live demonstration network at Interrupt Tokyo. Over 20 full head racks with contributed networking devices. And we designed uh, cutting edge technology networks, six maps and 12 days for construction and three days for exhibition. As I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, Interrupt Tokyo has uh, 120k uh, customers and Shonet provides uh, internet connectivity for all of the exhibitors and visitors with uh, cutting edge technology like a uh, segment routing and uh, all vendors uh, conducted the interoperability test and demonstrate the latest uh, networking technologies every year. Uh, let me explain this uh, slides. This is a show net uh, topology diagram. Show, uh, every year we illustrate the uh, show net topology in the single pane pictures. All of the devices uh, illustrated in this picture. As, uh, as I described, it, uh, red is uh, router L3 devices and Orange is uh, CGN or firewall or L4 devices. So all devices uh, is distributed in the, these maps. And it shows uh, how uh, ShowNet is a big network as a live demonstrations. And uh, Japanese customer always interested in uh, this ShowNet topology diagrams. And next slide is uh, who makes the show net? Uh, basically, NOC team is uh, designing show net six months and construction. And contributors, over 60, uh, 100 product specialists will join from vendors. So uh, first picture is uh, NOC team members. Uh, I'm also a member of the, this uh, NOC teams. And second picture, uh, it shows the uh, contributors. So, it looks how many people will uh, join to construct the show net. It's uh, uh, easy to show. Our volunteer members, uh, about 40 persons from academia students and industry junior staffs as a uh, uh, educational perspective. Uh, so uh, 
This is the introduction of the Inter uh, Tokyo Shonet. And let me start uh, today's uh, main tema, segment routing at Interop Tokyo Shonet. Uh, we have been continuously testing and showcasing the segment routing at Shonet. Uh, we are focusing these five years for Shonet uh, segment routing demonstrations. Uh, so let me start from the 2018 testing. This year, we uh, just uh, interrupt testing with eight devices from five vendors. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Shonet, uh, is, uh, Shonet is providing the internet connectivity to visitors, but uh, this year, uh, we don't uh, carry the customer traffic with a segment routing. This year is uh, just a testing. Uh, from the uh, 2019, we tried the cutting edge technology with customer traffic. Uh, 2019's challenge is the SRB6 service chaining. Uh, it's uh, standardized by this draft uh, SR service pro programming. Uh, based on this uh, draft, sheet represents the services. It means uh, network function or physical appliances. So, for example, one sheet uh, expresses a uh, firewall as a sheet uh, express the CGN functions. And the sheet list represents a series of services. So uh, in this picture, uh, SR policy one, uh, this policy one sheet list go to the, these three network functions. And SR policy two go to the another network functions. So we, if we use this uh, technology, we can easily control the service chaining, uh, order of the service chaining, or which function we can apply to each customer. So we built uh, segment routing based uh, service chaining in the Shonet 2019. In the uh, Shonet 2019, uh, we built the three SRB6 capable product and five uh, SRB6 proxies. Let me illustrate the traffic flows of the uh, SRB6 service chain. User packet coming from here and in the backbone router, one uh, in this portion, uh, SRB6 policy is applied. So each user is coming to, and where to go. Uh, this router checks the source and the destination addresses and applied uh, SRB6 policy. Uh, this user use uh, security function or CGN. So if uh, user's traffic is a private address, uh, this router adds a CGN function sheet. And uh, if this traffic is a global address, uh, this router don't as a CGN function sheet. And NCAP, the segment routing header, series of segment, header, segment uh, routing headers in this router and forwarded traffic to function pools. In the function pool, uh, a lot of function is uh, crowded in here. For example, CGN, firewall, sandbox, and other L4 functions. And if a uh, function can uh, support the SRB6 natively, packet will go to the function directly. And if a function doesn't support the SRB6, basically uh, it needs to remove the SRB6 set at first. So SRB6 proxy works on this proxy. So let me explain it in the next slide. And after applying the network function, uh, traffic will go back to the router and go to internet. This is a uh, basic behavior of the SR proxy. As I mentioned, not all services, network functions may be capable of the SRB6 encapsulations. It calls SR aware services, but uh, inner packets source and 
destination IP address is very important to apply the network function. For example, uh, CGN uh, modifies the uh, destination uh, source addresses, and firewall checks the uh, destination address for its uh, usual traffic or not. So, uh, network function needed to check the original uh, original IP address, in the IP addresses. So SR proxy integrates uh, SR aware services into SR v6 network. Basic behavior here is here. Uh, SR proxy removes uh, SR header and sends a packet to SR unaware services and coming back packet and restores the uh, original SR header and going to next uh, functions. Uh, this behavior is described in the uh, service programming draft, but uh, we have some challenges this year as uh, shown it. So we have the, some lack of the features. Uh, and AS, uh, this is known as a static proxy. Uh, it's very simple behavior. Uh, pop the outer headers and restore the uh, outer header in the interface in portion, but uh, it needs a static configuration, so easy to implement, but uh, difficult to apply the multiple service chains. So, Shonet has a lot of customers, so we can't apply uh, NS static proxy. Instead of this, uh, we applied end AM masquerading proxy. This behavior is uh, masquerading the IPv6 uh, destination address. So translation at interface out of field. So uh, C colon colon one packet uh, received in the SR v6 proxy. Uh, proxy translates uh, in destination address as uh, original in a packet uh, destination address. And after apply the SR unaware function, uh, destination address is also translated to the next uh, SRB6 sheet. This is uh, very easy to apply and stateless. So we can apply this proxy for IPv6 addresses, but uh, not easy to applicable to IPv4 in IPv6 packets. So we need the uh, additional proxies in this year. So uh, we propose a new method of the proxy. Uh, this is end AT caching proxy for IPv4 in SRV6 traffic. Uh, this is uh, idea is uh, basically uh, same with end AS, but uh, it will do. It, it in dynamically. So remove the IPv6 uh, header at the interface in uh, interface out portion, but uh, need to restore it. So cache the IPv6 header in cache entry and restore the packet at the interface in portion. But uh, if we do it uh, dynamically, we need to find the cache entry keys. So in the original IPv4 headers. So in this year, we use the TOS field for this search key. So if uh, TOS value is two, uh, SR proxy look up the entry two and restore the original SRV6 headers. With this uh, proxy method, we can uh, apply the SRV6 proxy for IPv6 traffic also. And we propose uh, internet draft regarding this function, but uh, currently it's not uh, maintenance. But uh, we finally, we would like to apply the SRV6 data plane correctly in the Shonet 2019. Uh, in that timing, uh, we don't have the enough uh, control plane, but uh, at in 2024, we have the PCEP ISIS 
BGP. So in the later year, we try the control plane. So I used a long time for this explanation. So let me uh, pack the uh, other slides. Uh, next uh, interesting uh, activity is a measurement experiment with uh, BGP ingress peer engineering in 2021. Uh, we constructed uh, SRM PLS based backbone network in this year. And we had three uh, external routers and three other transit ISPs in this year. Uh, ISP is uh, NTT and SoftBank and KDDI, uh, major three ISPs in Japan. So uh, this uh, slide is uh, explaining the EPE. Uh, basically, ASPR assigns a sheet for each uh, BGP peer. So in this case, uh, level 24025 uh, is uh, S2, and 24011 is S3. So if a uh, source router sends a packet with uh, 24011 levels for the external router, and uh, if BGP based pass is S2, but uh, router can send the packet to the S3. So it's uh, easy to control the egress uh, packet with uh, only single sheets. It's a good uh, technology for BGP traffic control because uh, BGP best pass cannot control by myself. So it's, uh, uh, it's improved the uh, uh, BGP traffic controls in the own ASS. So we use this technology to measure the internet uh, performance. So ping and stress rate to 2.6 million IPv4 addresses via 101 eBGP peers. So three transit ASS and 43 peer ASS agreed to join this experiment. And we obtained the land trip time to each destination via all possible passes. So we measured how best uh, the BGP best pass. So if uh, BGP best pass is uh, transit way, but uh, uh, alternate pass is uh, more uh, uh, good uh, performance in these cases. Uh, so how many uh, pass is the best for BCP. So this is the result of the measurement. There are shorter latency passes than BGP best passes. So this uh, graph shows this histogram of the number of BGP prefixes per latency. So uh, result is here. 77% of the measured prefix have alternate pass of the shorter latency than their BGP best pass. And 17% of the 17% uh, of the prefix got a 10 or 20 millisecond latency improvement by alternate pass. So we confirmed there is a room to improve the latency by BGP EPV with segment routings. Like this, uh, we are trying cutting edge technology and improvement every year. So, and regarding the, this uh, measurement result, we uh, read the paper in the PAM 2022 conference, uh, passive and active measurement. And also we uh, posted the EPIC blog also. So please check regarding the detail of this measurement. Okay. And uh, from the uh, 2021, uh, we continue to deploy the SRB6 VPN based uh, backbone in the show net. Uh, first year 2021 is a five product from Cisco, Fulcan Networks, Japanese domestic vendor, and Huawei and Jingpa contributed the, these devices. But at this point, uh, ISS is easy to uh, interrupt, but regarding the SRB6 LCVPN, 
uh, a lot of uh, encoding difference based on the early best, uh, early stage uh, internet draft, so draft zero one references. Uh, so, so for, for example, IPv6 next stops for IPv4 NLRI. Draft zero one references is uh, RFC 5549. So, first vendor, uh, uh, um, a vendor, uh, sorry, implemented with a uh, 16 byte uh, next stop, but uh, next version is also uh, draft 5549 divisions, but uh, from the draft zero block references is uh, RFC 8950. So, at this point, uh, encoding the 24 byte uh, next stops. Uh, this is uh, one of the example of the difference of uh, encoding. And we face uh, a lot of type of the implementing and uh, issues this year's interrupt, but uh, each vendor fixes release uh, patches during uh, construction period, so we can connect finally. But uh, a lot of struggling in this year, but and, uh, 2022, this is the second time uh, nine products from Cisco, Fulka, Fave, and Juniper is uh, connected for SRV6 VPN. Uh, this year, uh, draft. Uh, SRB6 service was published as RFC 9252. So this year, uh, SDVPN was worked uh, its in mature state status. So we can easily uh, connect in this year. Uh, so we can try the further advanced features, SRB6 flex algo and others. And this is the last year's uh, SRB6 deployment in the show net 2023. That this is a third time try. Uh, 15 products from Cisco, Furukawa, Huawei, Juniper, and NTT Communications. And we try to interrupt SRB6 without SRBPN. Uh, it means a global routing table, BGP AFI1 and SAFI1 or SAFI2. Uh, EGSP advertised IPP4 NLRI with SRB6 subsheet as its next stop. And ingress PE installed route to IPB4 or IPB6 destinations via sheets in the default routing table. Uh, delivering the benefit from the SRB6 transport without IPBPN. That's a, a last year's challenge. So uh, this is uh, one of the examples of the uh, Shira output. First route is in the default routing table, but uh, its next stop is uh, SRB6 uh, sheet as uh, expressed here. So uh, looking back at the Chronicle since 2019, implementations are steadily improving each year. As I mentioned, first year 2019, there are only uh, data plane features for SRB6 is, but uh, since 2029, SRB6 based LCBPN works and IPB6 single stack transport is very simple and easy to operate. So we don't need to manage uh, SRA 30 or SRA 31 IPB4 prefix per link to construct. Uh, and like this, uh, we don't need to uh, configure the IP addresses in the backbone link, only IPv6 enable is configured. It's very simple operations. And uh, scalability with address summary is uh, also made on SRB6 based networks. Uh, we can easily summarize uh, network addresses. And also flexible use cases, service chaining, and EPE is an uh, example of this presentation, but uh, it needs uh, requires uh, extra effort, but uh, we can achieve the additional and advanced features with SRB6 network programmability. 
Okay, so, and conclusion. We have demonstrated uh, segment routing in Interop Tokyo Shonet since 2018. Uh, and segment routing can build the network simply and easily, and it has the potential to realize uh, remarkable features so service chaining, traffic engineering, ingress engineering, and also uh, this year, we are also planning Interop Tokyo again. It's scheduled from June 12 to 14. So if you consider to try interesting demonstration, let's see you in Tokyo. <laughs> Thank you for uh, <laughs> presentation time. That's all for my presentation. All right, thank you very much, uh, Kamata-san. Um, we have time for a question or two. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Robin. OK. Jim uh, from Huawei, I uh, have the two questions. <laughs> like the first one, uh, you, you know, the TRFA is very important for SR. I'm not sure, uh, I cannot see the details about the TRFA interoperability test in uh, your presentation. Can you add uh, uh, the first one? Yeah, the second one, I think that's the uh, because you know the, for the traffic engineering and the service chain, the controller is important. But uh, you uh, seems more discussion about this the uh, device. So I want to learn how about the uh, situation about this the controller for SRV6. Uh, yeah. Okay. First question: TRFA is uh, or, or, I agree it's a very important feature. But uh, we don't have the enough time to test the failure scenario because uh, this is, we, we are carrying the real customer traffic, so we can try the TILFA in these networks. <laughs> so we did not uh, present it. And, uh, could you repeat again the second question regarding the service chain? Uh, my second question is the controller. Controller, uh, controller, service chain controller is. Uh, implemented by our service. Oh. So my, my own controller we are using because uh, there is no, <laughs> no uh, controller in the market at that, that timing. So we created it. Okay, 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 thank you. Thanks a lot. Any, any other questions? Do we have any online questions? No? All right, if that's the case, then thank you very much, Kamata-san. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. If you want to just leave it there. All right, so um, uh, thanks for that. The next talk is from Chenbin Lee or Robin from Huawei Technologies. Uh, Robin is the chief IP protocol expert uh, at Huawei, and he'll be telling us a little, little bit about SRV6 compression and, in particular, the, the replace CSID flavor. So, thank you very much, uh, Robin. Oh, hello everyone. Uh, this is Jin Bin from Huawei. Uh, today I will introduce the latest progress of the SRV6 and also introduce the SRV6 compression solution. Uh, that's the replace the CC the solution. Okay. Uh, in fact, this is my first time to the APNIC. It's very honor to have the chance to do the presentation. Uh, I joined the Huawei 2000 and uh, worked uh, for NPR's R&D for more than 15 years. Uh, since the 2017, I began to work on the SRV6, and uh, thanks to the important uh, chance for the industry, and uh, can do some of the contribution uh, to this work. Okay. Uh, in fact, in the process of our uh, a innovation for the IP technology. We summarize the rules of the IP technology evolution. Uh, that's the application drive the change of IP network architecture. Uh, because it's very known that the, for the wireless technology, they had the clear generation, uh, 1G, 2G, 3G. Now that's the think about this, the 6G. So, for the wireless technologies, they always uh, emphasize this, the speed of this the wireless uh, media. 
Uh, but for the IP technology, at the beginning, we do not think it's as a clear generation. Uh, but when we rethinking about this, the history of the evolution of IP technologies, uh, we can see that though we not change these characteristics of the IP, but we can still see that there's the different characteristics for the different time. Uh, so from here, we can see that the for this, the 1990s, the most important application is the internet. So that's drive this, the development of the IPv4. Uh, in the following this, the 20 years, uh, the most important application uh, is to change this, the traditional telecommunication networks to the IP-based networks. Uh, I'm lucky to almost experience the whole process in this process, MPR's technology plays an important role. Uh, so now, that's the, in the 2010s, that time, SDN is very popular. In fact, uh, that's the, in this era, the most important of this the new market is the data center networks. Because the traditional the data center network is layer two based. But uh, because of the large scale data center, they introduce this IP. In, for this, the data center networks and the VXLAN become these uh, de facto standards. Now we think the most important application is the 5G and the cloud. So we believe that the IPv6 extension can be more promising as a technical base to satisfy the requirement for these applications. Uh, in fact, uh, that's not the application uh, drive this the development of this the IP technologies. On the other hand, the most important is the development of this uh, software and the hardware. Because we always have this the requirement to extend the network functionalities. But uh, you know that's uh, 1990s at that time, we have the much limitation on the network hardware. That means this, we have this limited forwarding performance. At that time, it's very difficult to take use of the IPv6 extension header for this the network function extension. Because once we use the IPv6 extension header, the variable, this packet header size, will cause the great decrease of the forwarding performance. So at that time, we have to adopt this the hardware-friendly design, MPRs. That means the fixed packet header size, 32 bits, and then also has a fixed fields. That means the 20 bits, the label, and the 8 bits, TTL, et cetera. But uh, now, thanks to the breakthrough of this the network hardware, and also this the programming chipset, so now we can have this flexible forwarding logic. We can still achieve this idea, this forward, forwarding performance. So that is a strong base to use IPv6 extension header to satisfy the requirement for this the network functionality extension. So we can say that from the 1990s, from the SRV6, it's introduce the usage of this the segment routing header. And uh, almost at the same time, they, in the industry, they take use of this the hop by hop extension header or this the destination ex, uh, option header for other applications such as this the network slicing or the in-situ telemetry. So we can see that because of the breakthrough of this uh, network hardware, we can take use of this the IPv6 Eastern header to satisfy the requirement for new applications. Yeah. So now I just uh, take this one to uh, simply to introduce this the principle of SRV6. Uh, this is for the traffic engineering because they need an explicit path to traverse this A1 column two, A1 column three, to this A2 column one, and also the VPN located on this the PE node. So that's we can directly encapsulate the stack in this the segment routing header. 
and also use a pointer to indicate this is the current destination. So, and also steer this packet to the, uh, to each uh, node specified in this the stack. So we can say that's the hop by hop to the destination node. Uh, here, I wanted to emphasize the two points. The first point, we can take use of this the uh, data plane to explicitly specify this the path. Uh, second one, because you know that from this node to A2, A1 column two to A1 column three, there can be this the IP. They can take use of the IP reachability from this node to this node. That means once the network, they have the IPv6 reachability, we do not need to upgrade the network to support the MPR's reachability. They can directly to use the normal IPv6 reachability to implement the forwarding. So that means it can be compatible with the legacy IPv6 node. Okay, so in fact here, I uh, this uh, summarizes this, the vision of the SRV6 the evolution. That means the end-to-end -end network uh, unified forwarding process. Uh, in fact, here this, we can see that this is a multiple network domain. We know that for MPRs, uh, it's very successful in the past 20 years. But uh, the challenge is for the inter-AS, because when we deploy this the service, across multiple domain. We have to introduce the complex, the inter-AS VPN technologies, option A, option B, option C, et cetera. Uh, but uh, you know that with the SRV6, we have the search advantage. The first one is simplicity. So it means once we have the IPv6 reachability, we can upgrade this the to edge node and to take use of the IP forwarding to cross multiple domain. That means it is not necessary to use this the complex uh, MPR signaling. Uh, second one, I think that's uh, previous they emphasize because they can use this the root aggregation and can reduce this number of the forwarding entries comparing with the MPRs forwarding. So it can, because the number of the forwarding entries can be reduced, that means the scalability can be improved. Uh, and the second one and the user convergence. So that's the, we have this, the MPRs uh, era, they have this, the many protocols, but now that's almost can be converted to SRV6 uh, plus this uh, EVPN. That means uh, simplify this, the protocols in the IP network and also is a facilitate network operation and this maintenance. Uh, third one, I think this is very important. I think this is the end-to-end -end and the incremental deployment. Uh, because uh, we know now that the network is the IP network is the basic infrastructure and all these the device services converged on this the one IP network. So it's very difficult to change or upgrade this whole infrastructure. So this is the Incremental deployment is very important. Uh, thanks to the uh, IPv6 pioneers 30 years ago, they designed this the forward compatibility mechanism for the IPv6. That means now maybe we take this the IPv6 extensions for the new network functionality. And even for this the legacy node, they cannot pass this the new information for the new network functionality. It can still forward this packet as this is the normal IPv6 packet. So this means in the IPv6 uh, network, so the SRV6 and also other IPv6 based uh, extended functionality can be incrementally deployed. We think this is very important for the current IP network infrastructure. And the last point, I mean the extensibility. I mean so the SRV6 uh, is the first step for this uh, new network functionality because it introduces the IPv6 data plane 
and also this is the usage of this is the IPv6 extension header. So that means it can take use of the IPv6 extension header mechanism to support this is the more new functionalities such as network slicing and also the in situ telemetry. So this is very important. So this is also sometimes we always emphasize why SRV6, the most important word is future because we need more new features. Uh, new, new features, I think the IPv6 extension is very important. Okay, uh, because of now the SRV6 uh, standards is very mature, and also now that's uh, also has this the multi vendors implementation. Uh, that is the industry become very mature, and just because of the maturity of the SRV6, the deployment of SRV6 is uh, accelerated, and uh, this uh, until this the end of the 20. 22, they are already have more than 160 SRV6 deployment all over the world. Uh, okay, so this is the next part. The most, uh, this is regarding the SRV6 compression. Uh, in fact, the SRV6 has been deployed, and uh, in fact, they also face this challenge is the packet header size. Because we know the SRV6 segment is 16 bytes. That is 128 bits. So here we can see that we have this more segment encapsulated in the, in the packet. So we can see this the payload efficiency will be decreased. As a comparison, we can see that the MPRs the payload efficiency reduces very slow. Uh, and also because of the packet header size of the SRV6, it also has a mass challenge uh, for this the hardware and also this is the chipset. So this is very important to introduce the compression solutions to reduce this the header size of SRV6. So the SRV6 compression solution uh, was introduced. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in the IETF uh, 2019, they set up a design team. Uh, they had this the defined the requirement, and also they do some this the uh, do the comparison solutions analysis. Uh, so here, the this is the requirement, the key requirement. The first one, that is the overhead must be reduced. This is the basic purpose of the SRV6 compression. Uh, second one, the benefit of SRV6 must be maintained. That means we not introduce a totally new one. So the, for the SRV6 simplicity or the scalability search advantage must be maintained. And the third one must be compatible with this the IPv6 specification and also the SRV6 specification. <laughs> uh, so here, so we can see the glass on this, the history of this the SRV6 compression. Uh, this is the 1990s, that time. Many of these the solutions about SRV6 was pro were proposed in the industry and from the different vendors or this the operators. Uh, so that's the, <coughs> uh, this is the representative operators, they express the strong opinion. They need uh, to converge to a single solution. So the IETF set up the SRV6 compression design team. So after almost uh, more than one year's work, so also comparison of this, the different uh, SRV6 compression solutions at the last, uh, to take the U seed and also the G seed as the base to converge to the C seed solution. That is the compressed seed. And uh, after that, so this is the C seed draft was adopted by the working group as a single solution. Uh, and now that is in the process of the working group last call. That means the standards is already very stable and uh, it will uh, can be 
expected, it will be published as the RFC uh, quickly. Okay, so here this, uh, in fact, this is, oh, sorry. Okay, so this is this the uh, convert this draft. Uh, so we can see that's the many, this is the co-authors from the different vendors and this is the operators. And uh, in fact, the CC the solution has uh, two flavors. Uh, one is uh, replace CC the flavor, and another is the next CC the flavor. Uh, I will introduce more about the replace CC, and Mr. Clarence will introduce more about the next CC. Uh, in fact, there's also another flavor is combine these two flavor together. Uh, but because now there's not much implementation, uh, so that's in order to accelerate the standardization process, uh, is first removed from the latest, uh, the CC the draft. Okay, uh, in fact, uh, here I will give this the basic principle of SRV6 uh, compression, uh, this uh, CC. Uh, because uh, we know that uh, uh, our this, the IPv6 IP address always allocated from the same address block. This is the same for the SRV6 seed. Uh, so we can, so this is named as the locator block. So we can say that's the seed list in the SRA, SRH. But uh, we know that the, this is the seed in one network, they allocated from the same, this is the locator block. So this is the blue part. So this means this is the blue part information is the redundant, redundant information. If we can reduce this redundant information, so that we can compress the, this the SRV6 packet header size. Uh, on the other hand, for this the blue part, this is the key part. That means the different part for each seed. So this is the valid, valid part. So we call it is a compressed seed. So that means uh, we have this 100, uh, we 128 bits, but after remove this the redundant uh, locator block, but remaining this the information that's compressed the seed. So this is compressed the seed. It can be this 32 bits or the 16 bits. So that means we can reduce this the 128 bits to the 32 bits or this is the 16 bits. So that means the packet header size can be reduced to this the one fourth or this the uh, one eighth of the original SRV6 packet header. Okay, uh, so this is the SRV6 replace CC. So we can see here the, uh, in the IPv6 destination, they have this the SRV6 seed, the prefix. Uh, this is the locator block. So the blue part, the only remaining one. Uh, and also this is the CC, this is the 32 bits. But uh, we know that the, at the beginning, this 128 bits is just one seed. But now after compressed, it can have this the four, this is the 32 CC. So <clears throat> uh, once this CC is processed, it can take this one to replace the CC. And this is combined with this the prefix to, to become a new uh, normal SRV6 seed. So this replace one by one, so that we can get this the normal SRV6 seed one by one. Yeah, but uh, we know that the, this is the 128 bits, it has this the four C seed, but we must have the pointer to indicate which is the current CC. So here they have the arguments, it called this a segment index. So this indicates the current, this is the CC in the 128 bits CC container. So this is just like this is the two dimensional this array. So first we can get this is the 128 bits CC container but we use another pointer to indicate the specific CC in this the 128 bits 
cc the container. So this is just uh, the principle of the replace cc it. Okay. Uh, in fact, the SRV6 replace cc it, they have the much interoperability test. And, uh, and from this the 2022, they begin to deploy it uh, in the, all over the world. So this uh, at the beginning, we know that the China Mobile, uh, Huawei, and also these more than 10 vendors, they have this the interoperability test. And uh, also they, uh, this uh, in uh, 2020, uh, China Mobile, they have the field trial deployment of this the uh, SRV6 replace CC. Uh, from uh, 22, uh, 2022 to now, uh, there's already this the deployment. This is, uh, for example, the China Mobile, and also the MTN, and also the Asia Cell. Uh, quickly to introduce this one. <clears throat> uh, the first one, this is China Mobile. Uh, because at the beginning, they have their the IP backbone network. But uh, in the new era of the cloud, because they need this more flexible IP connection set up, so they must to reconstruct of their network. So they directly choose the SRV6 because of advantage. So that they take use of their, uh, take use of uh, SRV6 to set up the cloud private network to for the connect, uh, to for set up of the connection for the different cloud. So this is their the purpose. Uh, in this process, uh, they, because the, uh, Network uh, is the larger scale. That means they may have this the uh, SRV6 pass that they have the multi hops, maybe up to the uh, 15 hops. So the packet header size cannot uh, be accepted. So they directly adopt the SRV6 replace CC to deploy it as this the tunnel to bear this the services for the cloud. So this is the deployment of the China Mobile. Uh, second one, this is the China, MT, uh, sorry, this is the MTN. Uh, MTN is already deployed uh, uh, this in the three this uh, African countries. So this is the typical, this is the South Africa. They take use of the SRV6 for this uh, traffic optimization for the mobile transport network. Uh, we can see they are the pass. Uh, this average is uh, 17 hops. So that means they use this one for the SRV6. It's almost the 20 hops. That means 320 bytes for the packet header. This is totally unaccepted. So, <clears throat> but uh, you know that they want to achieve this purpose of the traffic optimization. So they adopt the SRV6 uh, uh, replace CC and uh, this is the base tunnel technology and uh, combined with the SDN controller. So they can achieve this the purpose of this the traffic optimization. Now their network can accord, accommodate more bandwidth. That means more service traffic. Uh, and also this is another one. So this is the Asia cell. Uh, so at the beginning, they take use of this the layer two plus this layer three. So this is for their the mobile uh, mobile transport network. Uh, but uh, we know that this the interworking between the layer two and the layer three is very complex. Uh, so when they <coughs> set up this uh, new network, they directly to adopt this the solution that is end to end VPN and over SRV six. So that they can directly to take use of SRV6 for the traffic optimization and also simplify the service provisioning of the VPN. Uh, and also they combine with the controller and use for this uh, traffic uh, automatic uh, uh, traffic optimization and also they take use of this the SRV6 replace CC. So this is also that you can accommodate the future, the uh, the long, the SRV6 TE pass. Uh, and also, <coughs> with the development of this the SRV6 and the uh, deployment of the SRV6 and the SRV6 compression, uh, so that's uh, 
uh, in the IETF uh, in Prague in the uh, November last year, uh, the operators, they organized the SRV6 operation set meeting. Uh, so we can see that the uh, operators, uh, the representative from this, the Bio Canada, uh, China Mobile, and also the MTN Swisscom and Telefonica share their experience of uh, deploy SRV6 and also SRV6 compression. I think uh, this is very helpful uh, for uh, learn uh, from each other about the deployment of SRV6 uh, and also this converge the effort of the industry. I think this will accelerate this uh, uh, deployment of the SRV6 all over the world. Uh, in fact, the, now this is the uh, for the coming IETF uh, in the Brisbane, Australia, uh, the SRV6 operation both has been accepted by the IETF leadership. There's will another the SRV6 uh, operation uh, both. So that's uh, the uh, plan to set up the possible working group to share this SRV6 operation experience. Okay. Uh, uh, in fact, after the SRV6 and also this the innovation uh, based on the IPv6 ex uh, uh, extension uh, is accelerating. Uh, now that they have the network slicing, in situ telemetry, and also the stateless multicast PRV6, and also the determined IPv6. So this is just like this the just like this the improvement of the driving experience. Because the SRV6, we have the navigator. Because of the network slicing, we have the dedicated lane. Because of this, the i we have this, the dashboard camera. So that's used for this pass tracing. So we believe that with such extension based on the IPv6, uh, we can achieve this the more, uh, uh, that better experience for our IP network. This is the similar as uh, this driving in the actual world. Okay, that's all my presentation. Thanks, thanks all. Okay. Thanks a lot, Robin. Um, do, we, do we have any questions? Anything online? No? Okay, that's the case then. Thank you, thank you again for that ex uh, excellent talk. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, so uh, for, the, for the last session, uh, we have uh, Karans Fis Fis from Cisco. He is a Cisco fellow, and he's, he's been a driving force behind SRV6. Uh, so it's excellent to have him here at Apricot. Uh, he'll be talking a little bit about the next CSID flavor of um, uh, CSID. Thank you very much, yeah. Many thanks. <clears throat> Indeed, I started the work on this in 2013. Uh, and it has been a lot of thought to come to this fantastic solution with uh, IPv6 micro segments. So thanks for the invitation. It's uh, super good to be back at Apricot. I presented, I had the chance to present uh, uh, in the past. Uh, and so it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, don't hesitate to follow up with me or with any colleagues. Uh, it's a pleasure. And uh, that's it. At, from an ITF viewpoint, the standard used the term SRV6 next CSIT. But in the industry, everybody talks about it as IPv6 micro segment used, and so this is the term I'm going to use here. This solution is very flexible. You can allocate the UCID block out of private address space or public address space. You can use UCID blocks that are independent from your IP address block. For example, 10 years ago, you deployed IPv6, no problem, ship in the night. You allocate the UCID block independently. You can allocate multiple UCID block, and we're going to see why for FlexAlgo, for having different ways of algorithms to, to compute shortest path. You can use UCID block of any length, and you can use uh, UCID length of any value, any length. And in the same network program, you can uh, combine micro instructions of different length. So it's highly flexible. So your question would be, but in practice, how is it design it, how is it deployed? And so I'm going to walk you in a few minutes through a typical deployment. And actually all of the deployments that I know of, all of them follow the design guideline that you're going to review with us. And you're going to see that it is super simple. 
This is IP just the way it should be and actually how it was 20, 25 years ago. So we are really getting back to the root of IP. So uh, some of the deployments that are following the design guidelines that I'm going to review, for example, Akash uh, Agrawal from Rakuten is there. Uh, he has shared uh, previously uh, a couple of weeks ago that they have completed the deployment of IPv4 micro segments at Rakuten networks, over 14,000 routers, and 70% of the services are supported over IPv6 micro segments. So Akash is there so that you can meet him, ask questions, etc. It's, it's very good. All of the lead operators for IPv6 micro segments are available uh, to share their experience. So don't hesitate. Swisscom has also shared the IPv6 microsegments deployment, such as Bell Canada, TPG, uh, Indosat, etc. So many uh, names that you will see in the past. Don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, the community is very uh, uh, happy to share. So what is the design? First, you take two algorithms in the IGP. This is called Flex Algo. You use the let's say ISIS, the best cost for ISIS, you allocate to do best effort routing, like all the time. And then you use FlexAlgo 128, which is a second dextra that you compute in ISIS, but you, co you, you compute it according to the per link latency, so you minimize the latency. And in the industry, we invented it back in 16, 17, it was the early days of segment routing, uh, typically, it's deployed with the Flex Algo 128 for low latency. And so, if you have an example here, uh, if you send a packet to node 2, you will have two ways to go to node 2. Either the min cost path in black or the min latency path uh, in red. And this is now pretty pervasive from a segment routing deployment viewpoint. Now, if you want to apply it for microsegment, the first step you need to do is to allocate blocks. It's about IP and you need you always sub-allocate from blocks. So all of the deployments that I know of deploy out of the private address place. So it, it starts with FC. And all of the deployments that I know of deploy with 32-bit private blocks. So it means that you allocate a private block for the min cost and you allocate a private block for min latency. We make it simple, and so for human beings, the best effort block is FC000001, the first number, best effort. And for latency, it's all the same eight hexadecimal digits, except the last one, which is eight. Why? Because typically in ISIS, this is FlexAlgo 128. But you do whatever you want. It just, as an illustration, it's easy to remember. So, we have now two algorithms that runs in ISS. I have two blocks. I'm going to allocate the global micro instructions to a node. The micro instructions, all of the deployments use 16 bits. 16 bits is represented by four nibbles. You have micro instructions that are global. You have micro instructions that are local. Here, we want to give a shortest path globally along a domain. So we're going to allocate a micro instructions that is globally significant. And here all of the deployments and all of the interrupt use a nibble, the first nibble, if the value is anything between zero to letter D, it means globally significant. And so I am node two, I'm going to make it easy. It is the four nibble, zero, globally significant, zero, zero, two, because it's not number two. But now that's it. I have everything I need because I append my micro instructions to my two blocks and I advertise them in ISIS like 25 years ago. It's that simple because in ISIS, I'm going to advertise, I am node number two and I am in the best effort block 0002 slash 48. And in the low latency block, according to Flex Algo 128, I am the low latency block 0002 slash 48. Plain IP. And immediately you understand why that solution enjoys seamless deployment in brownfield infrastructure. If I am node number three and I am on the path to a packet that goes to a micro instructions number two out of the best effort block, 
Do I need to be micro segment enabled, aware? Do I need to understand the network program? Not at all. Because what comes from, to me is the best effort block followed by 0002 slash 48. But that is a classic longest match. It's the base of the entire IP industry. So back in 2013, when I started to research on uh, IPv6 micro segments, we were really looking at reusing the base of IP. ISIS, BGP, and the classic longest match. These are the three pillars that you have to remember and that drive all of the research. So now we are going to look at a locally significant micro instructions. What could it be? Actually, a lot of use cases are locally significant. I am a PE router number two, and I serve a VPN. The local verb is a locally significant information to me. So I am going to bound to it a locally significant micro instructions. We know that the locally uh, uh, significant micro instructions, the first nibble will be E or F. To make easy, we always take F when we do a presentation. It's easy to remember. F, locally significant. I am verb number nine, so it's F009. Here we go. As soon as you allocate that local micro instructions for the verb, BGP advertise that, ha, huh, I am aware of 10.1 slash 16 in that verb, and if you want to send a packet, send it to me with that address. But that address, what does it read? It reads, according to the low latency block, come to node number two, where you will be decapsulated in verb number nine. So you see the block, let me point it out. The first 32 bits are saying, come according to the low latency path, to whom, to me, to do what? To be decapsulated in verb nine, that simple. If you take someone out of university, he's not going to understand we did something else before. Hardware efficiency. That has been my key theme through the whole research. It had to be efficient day one. So look at it from the viewpoint of node number two. If you come with an MPLS background or another legacy application, you look at the network program and you think, hmm, that thing means three things. According to the low latency slice, go to node number two, where you will decapsulate in verb table nine. And so the problem with legacy solution is that you get used to it. And for people who have done it for 20 years, they have a difficulty to get out of the box. And so that's what I'm trying to get you through is that this is not at all free lookups, not at all. In IPv6 micro segment, Node number two does a single slash 64 classic longest match. Classic, there's nothing new. It's a classic longest match. It's just that he recognized himself in slash 48. He could stop there, but it's not stupid. He's matching longer because he can recognize in one shot a longer program. So in one single longest match, he goes to the slash 64 and he has understood that packet reached me according to the low latency slice and I need to decapsulate in verb nine. That's the way it works. That's why it's so efficient from an hardware viewpoint. And in the deployments, this property is always used. And for example, Alibaba has extended the idea even for where they have, and I, it's up for them to share, I think they have shared, but they are going further where they are encoding in the network program more information and they are sometimes doing a slash 80 longest match because it's very smart in the design. So that network programming solution is absolutely intuitive and rich. Let's read it together. If the destination address of the other IP header uh, 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 is this one, then what does it mean? According to the best effort slice, go to node number two where you decaps into VPN nine. That's a classic VPN. Okay, second one. According to the low latency slice, Go to node number two where you decaps in VPN nine. But that is the first time we have the coupling of underlay traffic engineering and overlay that easy. 
you express it in only the outer destination address. Third examples. According to the best effort slice, go to number three, and from there, go to the shortest path in the best effort slice to node number two, where you will decaps in VPN9. That's a typical example that you don't want to go straight to number two, because maybe on the path, there is an unsecured link. And your controller has computed that actually to avoid that unsecured link, you first go to node three, and then from node three, you go to two, and you avoid it. And you have many permutations. What it is, it's traffic engineering. So here, in the outer DA, you have expressed an end-to-end -end network program that is absolutely stateless. Inside the network, nobody knows uh, go to node three and then go to node two and then decaps in the VPN. Nobody knows. Most of the routers only have a longest match ISIS route to node three. Then other routers will have a longest match to node two and then node two will recognize himself and will decaps. This is stateless. And the entire end-to-end -end programming is in the outer destination address. Next example. I have combined it under the engineering and overlay creation. What is the one missing? And the one that you will never find another solution being able to do it. It's not possible. MPLS cannot do it. VXLAN cannot do it. I am going to combine a network program end-to-end -end which combines underlay, overlay, and service, service chaining creation. And what is it? According to the law, uh, to the best effort slice, go first to node number three where you take a firewall VNF bound to the locally significant address F005, then go to the egress PE number two, where you will decaps in the table nine. And that's it. You have now in the program combined everything you want to do service creation, overlay, underlay, and service chain. Let's say that someone in your team come up with a brilliant idea to do some cryptographic idea. You have the, you can bound your micro segments to whatever you want. So you can do whatever you want through the network programming model. In the outer destination address, you see that with a 32 bit block, we can put six micro instructions. My examples are quite powerful. You see that I have never consumed my budget. I'm always under. And so when the micro instructions are not used, because you don't need them in your expression of your program, you fill them with all zero values. And the four nibble zero means end of the program. So very easy. You read from left to right, and when you hit four zeros, end of the program. Okay. And when you complete a micro segment, you simply shift by four nibbles to the left and you proceed. That's simple. Again, hardware efficiency, a shift is the most basic uh, behavior from a computer science uh, viewpoint. This provides ultra scale. By using the private address space and only consuming 0.2% of the private space, I offer 4 billion globally significant micro instructions. That's it. By combining micro segments of different length, like for example, what has been done with some of our deployments, we have four billions locally significant micro instructions, more than enough. We support route summarization, which allows to uh, increase the scale of your routing by 20 times on average over MPLS. And we have, with the micro segment, the best compression efficiency in the uh, industry. What about the segment routing extension header, Clarence? We defined it because we need a solution that supports any kind of extension, any kind of future. But most of the time, the segment routing extension header is not used. Because all what you do is at the edge of your network, you receive your customer packets, IPv4, Ethernet, whatever, and you put it in a single IPv6 outer header 
40 byte, that's it, finished, fixed offset, easy to read in hardware. And in the other destination address, you have six macro instructions. And we could see that you can express a lot with six macro instructions. That's why all of the deployments are actually never using the segment routing extension header. But it could happen in the future, we support it, etc. It, it provides room for future expansion, but currently it's not used in these deployments. So let's say that you would have a use case for it, then you would use a segment routing extension header, and every time you bring a 16-byte uh, SID into it, it actually brings six additional micro instructions. And you can see that even if you would use it, you would really use a very small uh, SIH. This is also the reason why I call the solution IPv6 micro segment, because the segment routing extension header in practice is never used or rarely used. Benefits. This solution is solving three paradox that are absolutely amazing. The first paradox is we bringing a revolutionary network programming solution that beats any legacy solution. VXLAN by multiple orders of magnitude and as well MPLS. No other solution can combine overlay, underlay and service chaining like what is being done with the USIT solution. So we bringing this very rich solution but you would expect that richness of an architecture comes with weak hardware performance. That's, that would be the, the expectation. Or the reverse, you would expect that something that is highly efficient from the hardware is very constrained, a bit hacked, and you cannot express a lot. And here, it beats that paradox that you have something extremely rich, but at the same time, hardware efficient from the best, because we have always been carried our first objective was hardware efficiency. We've been always researching this with the hardware team. It has always been a key focus. It has to be line rate, otherwise it will not work. And it has to be low overhead. So it has always been driven. And we found the micro segment idea in 2016. So we took a long time to really engineer it well so that it's well fought, well built, etc. And so we are very happy with the outcome. So it's line rate across our entire portfolio. Second paradox, you bring such an innovation to the IP industry, you would expect it doesn't interoperate with the brown field. You need to replace everything to get it. Not at all. It fits absolutely well in the brown field deployment. Why? we engineer the network program behind the classic longest match. Legacy routers don't see it at all. They route like 25 years ago. This is present in all of our deployments, obviously. People are not wrapping up an old network and replacing it. That's why it went so quickly. Third paradox. Let me give you an analogy in the car industry. If you compare an Audi A4, very good car, with a 500 in a city use case, you know that the 500 will win. Because the, fi the, the 500 has been optimized for the city. So the Audi A4 cannot compete in the city use case. Now take a Jeep and you compare it with the Audi A4 in off-road. You know that the Audi A4, despite being a very good car, will uh, fail against the Jeep, because the Jeep has been optimized for its custom use case. So as engineers, you know that a custom solution for a custom use case will always win a general purpose solution. It's not the case here. That is really shocking. It should be shocking. You have a solution that applies for any domain. It applies in the data center, in the access, in the metro, in the core, on the host. It's an IP address. It's in the socket from day one. And in the cloud, it applies to all of the domains. And in any of the custom use case, it beats the custom solution. And that's not me who say it. It's operators. So two years ago, recorded on segmentrouting.net, Dan Voyer from Bell, who deployed SRMPLS in 2016 and jumped to use it in 21, explain why he made the change. 
With IPv6 usage, you get native optimum slicings. You get an hardware line rate push, which is three times better than MPLS. You get an hardware counter and FIP consumptions that is four times better. The routing scale is 20 times better at least. The lookup efficiency is two to three times better. And then the herd of IP. What is the herd of IP? ECMP. IP is about meshiness, multiple equal cost multipath. How do you ECMP in MPLS? DPI. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, and there are no two implementations that are the same. In IPv6 usage, it's flow label, architecturally defined it 20 years ago. More entropy, fixed offset, and you, here you go, you have a much better uh, uh, load balancing solution. But that is important. Load balancing is the key to have an efficient utilization of your backbone. What about the data center? Gian Mishra from Verizon, also recorded on segmentrouting.net, reported it last year at Paris, why IPv6 usage outperforms VXLAN in the data center. It's in the host. We had to do nothing almost to get it into Linux on the socket because it's an IPv6 address. And actually, you can take a legacy host and the SDN controller tells you, hey, send a packet to that address. The host doesn't need any extension because he doesn't know it's an address from his viewpoint, it's opaque, and here it goes. The host is an actor of an SDN control solution because in the address, there is information that the network will understand. It's extremely powerful in terms of brownfield legacy implementation. Then it allows to do TE in the data center. There are so much uh, talk about uh, uh, congestion and efficiencies of uh, clusters that you understand that the applicability to have traffic entering in the data center is obvious. But there is more to this. What is in the data center? The application. And the applications, they want to signal the intent for the traffic engineering or the policy or the firewall in the rest of the network. You have two solutions. Either the application hack it through a few proprietor bits in VXLAN, and at the DCI, you kind of have a gateway that costs a fortune and that is very low scale and highly unreliable that maps from VXLAN to another header like MPLS. Or you start from IPv6 usage all the way from the application. And the application encodes into the destination address what it wants from the rest of the network. And here you go, you go completely pass through on the data gateway, your scale goes up, your cost goes down, and the reliability goes up. No brainer. If it's not sufficient, the overhead with an IPv6 usage solution is 5% less than with an IPv6 VXLAN solution. So it means that your fabric cost is 5% cheaper. Everybody takes 5% cheaper. When we started the IPv6 uh, usage project, we committed to our lead operators. We did the kickoff in Rome. Uh, in 2017, end of January, uh, and we have the picture, it will be in the book. Uh, and when we had that meeting, uh, we committed that we would build a rich ecosystem. We committed we would make it standardized. So we are very, very, very happy to have that slide where we see that everybody is part of the ecosystem. That's a sign of IPv6 macro segment. It's the sign of the success, and for us, uh, we work very hard to get it there, and we are really happy. Same for the interrupt testing. Uh, everybody is participating to the IPv6 UCID uh, interrupt, and it's also uh, excellent. Uh, as we said, we uh, made sure that everything is to the ATF. It's proposed standard RFC. Uh, it's excellent. This is, we went through this. Uh, I'm going to be in time. We have deployment across the whole spectrum. We have deployment in the core, in the metro, in the access. In the NFV, data center, cloud host, we have deployment everywhere. We have deployment in hyperscalers. We have deployment in service provider. We have deployments in enterprise, utilities, etc. The theme of my team is simplicity always prevails. Yes, it's hard work over a long time. We've been thinking very hard over this. But the outcome of all of that thought process is to drastically simplify the solution, to come back to the basis of IP, but with a much richer uh, service creation model, 
much more scalable, much more robust, because there are much less components. You understand it well, a car with less component is more reliable. You have much less component in this solution. And so we really uh, thanking our lead operators. Uh, you, you give them, you have them all uh, on the list here uh, for publicly talking uh, about the deployments. Akash is present. 14,000 routers deployed at Rakuten, 70% of the services running it. And this is really the sign of the team, is that people are willing to share, so don't hesitate to connect with uh, Akash, with other lead operators, uh, it will be good. And that's it for my talk. I really thank you. We are just in time. Any question? Got one coming up. Well, not a question per se, but just to add on to uh, an announcement that Robin was making. At ITF, we have SRV6 Ops BOF, which is for the first time we'll be deciding whether we need uh, a separate BOF for uh, a separate working group to talk about operational issues which are related to SRV6. I'm one of the co-chairs for that BOF, so I would really invite some of the people who have experiences running SRV6 network, come and talk to ITF. And, and give us your inputs on how we can do this better. What are the best practices? What are the operational issues? And it's a difference between how SR, MPLS, and SRV6 are sort of a different ball game operationally. And that is the point we want to drive across at ITF as well. And that's why it needs its own uh, working group, not be coupled with pure V6 ops or pure uh, like spring working group, which does SRMPLS plus SRV6. So uh, folks in this room who have experience, please come and share with, with us at ITF as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I really encourage those who know, who have done it, to really be active, to make sure that this outcome of the, the buff, which is, I think, very good, be practical. Simple, practical, easy, and not like page on page and page of documentation for nobody and making things unneedly complex. So that's why, the lead operators, I really uh, encourage you to help. I think it's a, it's a great. Okay. Well, many thanks. Thank you very much for that excellent talk there, Clarence. Um, so that, that brings us to the end of the uh, segment routing session. Uh, thank you so much for attending.